There's something about the concept of a poison garden that either titillates or terrifies, depending on your preferences. The UK's most famous poison garden is at the Anna Garden in Northumberland, and its influence is so far-reaching that if you Google poison garden, it dominates the first several pages of results. So much so, that I assumed the poison garden was an established concept in horticultural history. Not so, it turns out. Yet it does descend from a historical gardening ideal, the apothecary garden. So in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore, you and I are going on a voyage of discovery in these exact gardens. Just be careful not to touch anything. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, A.C. Sedgwick. We are continuing floral month this month as it is March and obviously we are starting to see here in the Northern Hemisphere some signs of spring finally returning. And I did think, because I talk so much about the folklore of poisonous plants here on the show and there have been an entire months dedicated to it in the past that it might be quite a good idea to actually look at the concept of the poison garden and this was actually originally an article that I'd written for the Folklore Thursday website but then I ended up going back to it and expanding it a little bit and finding a little bit extra information so we will be covering some poisonous plant folklore as well as we go through so it's not just going to be the history of gardens but it is going to kind of look at where the concept of the poison garden actually came from. Now, herbalism as a discipline is probably as old as humanity, and we still commonly use some of the practices today. So, hands up if you've had lemon and ginger tea for a cold, or peppermint tea for indigestion. Now, these herbal approaches to medicine come to us from the medicinal or apothecary gardens, which were often found within the walls of monasteries across Europe. And indeed, one such garden on the site of the largest medieval hospital in Scotland actually provided an inspiration for Annex Poison Garden. It seems the larger infirmaries had their own apothecary gardens manned by the monks before the dissolution of the monasteries. And the word apothecary actually comes from apotheca, which was a store for herbs and spices. Now, some of the plants grown in these gardens actually carry a clue about their helpful past in their botanical name, And that's if you see aficionalis in their sort of botanical name. So English Heritage explains that the monks stored their medicines and herbs in an officina or storeroom. So this could include sage, which is salvia officinalis, betony, which is stachys officinalis, and comfrey, which is symphytum officinali. Now monks might use sage to cleanse the body and whiten the teeth. Betony appeared in a whole range of cures and it seems like they pretty much thought it did everything and they also used comfrey, otherwise known as knit bone, to help heal wounds and even set broken bones. Now obviously if you are going to have a look at herbalism I do highly recommend that you study with licensed practitioners and don't just do a quick google search because obviously some herbs you're probably quite safe with like I say obviously peppermint tea chamomile tea things like that but there are still some medical conditions that obviously certain teas and herbal remedies and what have you will not work with or they can also contraindicate regular medication that you're on as well so always make sure if you're doing anything to do with herbalism that you know what you're doing and that you actually check that it's not going to be a problem with anything else that you're also taking as well. Now, obviously, back to the physic gardens and apothecary gardens and what have you. And one of my favourites is the Chelsea Physic Garden, which is an excellent example of the medicinal garden. And it was originally founded by the Worshipful Society of Apothecaries in 1673, making it London's oldest botanic garden. Now, the site did previously house a market garden, but the physic garden now contains around 5,000 different species that are medicinal, useful or edible. And it's also an excellent sort of source of education and public outreach and so on as well. Now, Sue Minter, in her History of the Chelsea Physic Garden, explains that it basically helped to legitimise the apothecaries as a reputable medical body during the 17th century, because this was a period in which they faced some quite stiff competition from the physicians. So in this particular period, you had the physicians who would go and see people, they would diagnose illnesses, and they would write prescriptions for what they thought would cure or treat them. 
And then the apothecaries dispense those prescriptions from their shops. So we would recognise them in a role a little bit more akin to a pharmacist or a local chemist or something like that. You also had a third branch of medicinal practitioner and that was the surgeon and they carried out the exact role that you imagine that they would. Now legitimising apothecaries both ensured that these apothecaries could accurately identify the plants that they needed for medicinal products but it also meant that they had somewhere that they could actually go to find out what these plants were and they finally got the legal right to practice medicine in 1704. Now having access to the apothecary garden basically meant that they also learned how to actually care for the plants as well so it wasn't just about being able to identify them they also had to know how to cultivate them as well. And as one particular example, apothecary John Watt became the Chelsea Physic Gardens manager in 1680 and he actually built the first greenhouse. And in 1681, he added a stove which would heat the greenhouse and as a result, he managed to grow a chinchona tree, which is a source of quinine that was otherwise scarce and expensive to use in anti-malaria products. But of course, it wasn't just the Chelsea Physic Garden that was doing all this kind of thing because the Royal Botanic Gardens upriver at Kew were originally intended as an apothecary garden as well. They were actually upgraded to a research centre in the 1780s and they had then become a national institution by the 1840s. And I would say if you're in London, both the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew and the Chelsea Physic Garden are well worth a visit. They are both really quite fascinating places to wander around. The Chelsea Physic Garden's a lot smaller, so it's easier to fit into a shorter visit period, whereas Kew's kind of a little bit more like you'd spend a whole morning or afternoon there. But they are really, really interesting places to visit. I must admit, if you do go to Kew, be careful, because I went in one of the hot houses, you know, the the big glass houses that they've got. And obviously I wear glasses. And I'm saying obviously because you might not know that, but I do wear glasses. And obviously they steamed up so I had to take them off so I could see, but then I couldn't see because I'd taken my glasses off. So just be aware of that if you are a fellow glasses wearer. Now obviously my main focus in this post is apothecary gardens in the UK, but obviously they did exist outside the UK as well. And another of the inspirations for the poison garden at Anik was actually the botanical garden of Padua. And this was founded by the Venetian Republic in 1545. And like the one in Chelsea, its original function was to both grow medicinal plants and allow students to learn to identify plants. Now, as a result, they also had poisonous plants in their medicinal collection because obviously A, they needed to be able to identify them. But a lot of these poisonous plants do also have therapeutic properties as well. So just because something's poisonous doesn't necessarily make it useless. It just means you've got to treat it with a lot more respect. And actually, if you go nowadays, the garden boasts a specific poison collection. You could also find botanical gardens across all regime France as well. And Louis XIV actually issued an edict in 1707, and I quote, that each medical faculty was to have a professor of botany and an associated botanical garden, end quote, which does demonstrate quite how important they consider these apothecary gardens to be, that they could actually then grow their own plants and they needed someone who knew what they were doing. And indeed, one of these gardens at Brest actually began life as an apothecary garden in 1694. And this one benefited from its position in Brittany because naval officers and medical professionals would then bring seeds and plants to Brest from different parts of the world because that was basically where they would first arrive. So it did mean that they ended up with a really massive botanical collection. Now make no mistake that these apothecary gardens are filled only with safe or pleasant healing plants because like I say at the Chelsea Physic Garden you will also find their poisonous cousins lurking within this gorgeous green oasis. So just some, some examples you will find deadly nightshade, larkspur, monkshood and mandrake and they all rub shoulders with the likes of periwinkles, campanula and peonies and indeed obviously deadly nightshade, larkspur, mandrake and monkshood have all been on the podcast before. But therein lies the point of the apothecary garden because it became the best way for trainees to learn the differences between the plants. Because as Minter points out, and I quote, apothecaries needed to be able to identify the herbs they would be purchasing to compound their products and thus avoid adulteration, poisonings or ineffective treatment, end quote. So thanks to this hands-on approach to learning, they didn't create remedies that ended up being poisons. Unless, of course, they wanted to. Now, obviously, one example would be common monkshood, otherwise known as Aconitum napellus, which is also known as Aconite, Wolfsbane, Devil's Helmet and Blue Rocket. And according to myth, this one sprang up from the drool of Cerberus, the guard dog of the underworld, and the ancients would use it to poison each other's water supplies in times of war. 
Yet Maria Povsnar's research in Slovenia in 2017 actually showed a therapeutic use of aconitum in folk medicine, and an extract of the plant was used to treat gout, neuralgia, rheumatism, and toothache. Now, obviously, I can't stress enough how much you shouldn't really mess about with these plants if you don't know what you're doing. And remember, a Google search is not the equivalent of a medical or pharmaceutical degree. So if you are ill, I would recommend you see your doctor in the first instance. But if you do want to have a look at herbal remedies, then I'd probably recommend finding a licensed herbalist or indeed an experienced herbalist and obviously speak to them first. This podcast episode is obviously for entertainment and education purposes, it is not any kind of training material. But all that being said, the early apothecary garden was intended as a training ground for apothecaries and other botanical students. And this same educational thrust really does lie behind Annex Poison Garden, although it does come with quite a large side helping of marketing. Now, the Poison Garden is a pet project of the Duchess of Northumberland, and it's basically tucked away into a locked section of the Annex Garden. Now, the original of the whole Annex Garden was actually designed by Capability Brown in 1750, but then fell into disrepair. And after first bringing the Annex Garden back to life, the Duchess then decided to add the Poison Garden as well. And visitors can only get inside on a guided tour because some of the plants are so fearsome that obviously you kind of need to be protected from them rather than the other way around. I think the only time I've been able to go around it unescorted has been in the winter when everything's died back so it's basically just kind of bare branches on on display and even then you feel a little bit weird being in there. Now the Poison Garden itself actually opened in 2004 and it now provides education around particularly toxic substances so you would certainly recognise some of the specimens which include the likes of tobacco, rhubarb, laurel and box. Now, the latter two plants, you'll often find them in garden hedges, although box also played a role in funerals in northern England because when somebody died, the family would leave a bowl full of sprigs from the shrub by the deceased's door and mourners would then take a sprig to later throw into the grave. Now, obviously, I dare say some of you would also recognise cannabis if you saw it. And the Duchess does have a licence to grow opium poppies and the coca plant, which is the one that gives us cocaine which also helps to reinforce the educational nature of the garden. The Incas considered the leaves of the coca plant were a gift from the gods, and royal messengers would take the leaves on long journeys to help them through their arduous travels. But then this really quite sacred plant that had a lot of important connotations then basically ended up in the original formulation of Coca-Cola, and it was only finally removed in 1904. And that is, of course, part of where it gets its name from. Now, a lot of these illegal plants, which are considered the most dangerous or sought after, do grow inside cages. But obviously, like I've said, considering the fact they've got the likes of laburnum trees and rhubarb in there, you can find equally dangerous plants in your garden at home. So just be aware of that. But I do think in some cases that this is perhaps the key to the Anic Poison Garden success, because it is quite rare that you would ever see some of the plants up close, particularly something like an opium poppy. You would, of course, come across the likes of common poppies or Welsh poppies and so on quite easily anywhere around the country. But obviously, some of the plants that are in the Poison Garden are actually common sites in English towns and cities. So you've got the likes of Lily of the Valley, Foxgloves, like I said, Laburnum, Yew. Ancient peoples actually saw Lily of the Valley as a bad omen and anyone who planted a bed of the flowers would die within a year. Fun fact, we used to have a cherry tree in my front garden. And my mother planted Lily of the Valley at the bottom of it and then it basically killed the cherry tree. So there you go. And obviously we've covered yew trees before in the past. So if you're interested in yew trees, there's that episode there as well. But like I say, a lot of these trees and plants, if you treat them with respect, you pretty much can't go far wrong. I mean, foxgloves are absolutely fabulous to have in the garden because not only are they really pretty, they're also really good for bees and other insects and so on as well. So a lot of them are perfectly fine to have in your garden as long as you know what you're doing with them. But I mean, that's pretty much the same with anything, really. But as well as its sheer dominance of the Google results, the Poison Garden's influence even reaches into fiction. And The Turn of the Key by Ruth Ware actually features an overgrown and forgotten poison garden on the estate of a large Scottish house. And at its centre stands a statue of Achilles, the obscure Greek goddess of misery, sadness and sometimes poison. And it was quite interesting reading that particular novel and going, oh my god, they've got a poison garden. And that was kind of what made me think it was a really common thing. And then I googled it and found actually no it wasn't. And that was what led to this post originally. Now obviously the fact that there's an ancient goddess with links to poison isn't really that surprising because the ancient Greeks were no stranger to using poison and one of their state-sanctioned methods of execution actually involved the state poison which was a fate meted out to Socrates in 399 Common Era. 
Now, this poison was later determined to be poison hemlock, and Joe Levy notes that poison hemlock is actually the most common type of the plant, and it's actually related to parsley and fennel. Poison hemlock causes paralysis throughout the body until it reaches the respiratory system and the victim dies. So it's a very unpleasant way to go indeed. But obviously such poisonings aren't restricted to the ancient Greek state because our final star of the poison garden that we're going to have a look at is the castor plant, which is the source of both castor oil and ricin. And in 1978, Bulgarian dissident Georgi Markov died of ricin poisoning after being targeted on Waterloo Bridge in London. His assassin delivered the ricin in a tiny wax-covered pellet, injected it in Markov's leg using an umbrella. Now, ricin comes from the seeds, which, as I say, also give us castor oil, which is traditionally used as a purgative. And obviously, once it got into Markov's system, there was pretty much no way to stop it because there is no antidote and there is no effective treatment. And obviously, Markov died as a result. Now, it does seem only fitting that we would end our trip to the apothecary and poison gardens with a plant that would actually be equally at home in both of them. And whether you regard plants as something pretty for your garden or the untapped source of medicinal riches, one thing becomes clear. Plants have a great capacity to help and heal us, but they can also do great harm. And as we saw with rice, the same plant can quite easily do both. It just depends how you wield it. So I would say take care of the plants that you've got in your garden, learn about their properties and what they need to thrive and also be 100% positive that you've got the right plant before you try to use it as anything other than a precious garden ornament. So what I'd like to know is have you been to the Anic Poison Garden? Have you been to any of the other botanical gardens? Do you indeed have a tendency towards what I sometimes call toxic botany? Because I do know quite a lot of people who do practice the more baneful side of herbalism and can utilise the useful properties of a lot of the more poisonous of the plant family. So obviously if you're one of those people as well please do let me know because there are a lot of really fascinating resources available about that online as well which is really cool really but there we go. So that is the end of this week's episode. I hope that you enjoyed it. And obviously, as always, if you do have any questions or any comments or anything, please do feel free to post on the blog post that this is attached to. If you're listening on YouTube, obviously just pop a comment below and that's really cool and I'll answer any questions if I can. And next week, we're actually going to have a look at lavender, which is like the complete opposite of a poisonous plant because it's actually one of my absolute favourite plants it is so useful in so many ways. So we're going to have a look at some of the folklore and legends behind lavender. I haven't decided what we're actually going to do for the final plant of March. So if you do have a request, please do let me know. And if I haven't done it before, then I will obviously see about doing that as well. I'm thinking possibly the iris, but I'm not sure. So as I say, if you have got a particular request, there is a request form below. Please do let me know. And obviously you can also message me on Twitter and Instagram as well. But that is the end of this week's episode. I will see you next week for Lavender. I hope you have a marvellous week ahead and I hope you manage to stay healthy, happy and safe. So without any further ado from me, cheerio. Well, thank you for listening and thanks for visiting Fabulous Folklore. I hope you enjoyed your stay. If you did, why not consider subscribing in your podcast app of choice? If you enjoy the show, why not leave me a review and help other listeners to find it as well? And if you'd like bonus exclusive episodes of the podcast, then why not support me on Patreon? It does help me to keep the show going and it means that you get a little bit extra every month as well. And you can find all of the necessary links in the show notes below. So without any further ado, I will bid you adieu and I hope that you have a safe travels wherever you're going on to next.